systems, uh, you know, the biggest thing guys do is run two batteries for graphs. Uh, you can still easily run one battery. Uh, I do only run one. I run a 31 series uh, DECA Intimidator. Uh, the, the biggest thing is that people need to understand is, A, if you just do standby all the time, you'll be fine battery power-wise. Uh, but the biggest thing is if you go on your graphs and you basically, so on Humminbird, it's 1 through 10 with the brightness. If you take it down to like an 8 on all the graphs, I never run into a problem. So that's the biggest thing, just backing that power down on the actual lightness on the graph a little bit, and it makes a big difference in your battery power. Did you hear that, Risk? Yeah, that's a, that's a juicy little nugget right there. Yep. Man, for sure. I'm telling yeah. you right now, I've never I've never heard anybody say that makes a lot of sense. Yep. And um, so, so I'll uh, I'll certainly take that into account because I'm excited to be able to have such um you, you know such such a presence there where I can see 360 yes. side imaging. Uh, you know, I can see it all at the same time, you know, the, term, the big screens with the GPS. Um, I'm, it's a really, it's a big step up for me from what I was just running, which, you know, I think I had 10 inch screens or eight inch screens, you know, around the boat. So um, I'm really excited, excited about the Solix. Appreciate you helping me. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you, Pete, when you, when you get that 360 going and Riz can test to this too, like when you get that 360 going, you fish the upper bay a lot. The grass patches, the grass lines, the bump outs, it is just absolutely amazing what you can see. And the best part is you can cast right to it one yeah. cast. There's no guessing. It's just you like you that, grass, yourself. that grass clump every time. Every time. And every time. You, your bite percentage will go up because of that reason, because of the 360, yep. period. Yep. I'm excited about that. Yep. And it's amazing how how user-friendly the hummingbirds are Very. as well. You know, like I, I, I've, I've always used them. Um, the hummingbirds and i'll be honest i'll get it if i get around a lorance or a or a garmin i don't know what i you know i don't i don't know how to dial that thing in but hummingbird it's so yeah. cut and dry user friendly how to do it and the you know the quality from top to bottom is incredible yep i gotta i gotta agree on, with you yeah, on a sponsor plug right there true, 100% <laughs> truthful <laughs> and you know the other side of it, Pete, too, for what you're doing is, man, the one boat network where everything inside of your boat now can talk to each other, and it, it just simplifies fishing. That's that's pretty much what it does. Absolutely. Well, and, and I like I agree with Riz that the soon the it's intuitive, right? What I found when using my hummingbirds when I didn't don't know what I'm doing, I have an easy way to figure it out. Like yep. it, it's not that complicated where I've got to you know go on to a different resource to figure it out most times so uh I, i'm i'm looking forward to getting i've never had the touch screen so that's that's the oh. upgrade for me <laughs> it makes it so nice oh. so nice that, awesome well looking forward to it we've got a lot going on guys you guys are watching us on youtube i want you to click the subscribe button and turn on those notifications if you want to if you want to see what we're doing every time we go live click on that little bell notification so you know when we're live We've got uh, we're going to be live every week at 7 p.m. Um, so or Thursday nights at 7 p.m. So look for that, but click on that little button. Riz, what else we got going on tonight? As always, Pete, uh, we're going to be taking questions from the message board. Um, those messages come from our Bash U TV subscribers, and when we use your message on the when we use your question uh, in the show. We're going to send you a prize. We're either going to send you some Rapala products, some missile baits, maybe some Bashu official uh, uh, hats or shirts. Um, but here's the deal, guys. If you're over there on Facebook, we're going to be able to use some of your questions, but not all of them. So if you want to be a part of tonight's show, head over to, to Bashu.tv okay, and get signed up. You can take advantage of a free trial right now. Watch the show over there. Get your questions involved in the show, and we can we'll, we'll send you some stuff um as well um we have a ton of great releases coming out um it, it, in the pipe right now in the next few weeks we have an interview with wes logan dropping on june the first june the first june 3rd we're doing we're dropping pole docks and floating docks with brandon cobb um and then june 10th i'm really excited about this one pete flipping grass with matt heron Ooh. that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a great seminar i've already cut the teaser for that and i can't wait to release it yeah, that that's great. I know. Uh, I just um, get preparing for tonight's show. I was listening to Garrett's. Um, I did a seminar or a uh, interview with him about flipping grass, and he's got some really unique grass flipping strategies that um, that that were pretty cool. So yeah, we we love fishing grass. Yeah, I believe he was drop shotting the grass, right, Pete? 
He was. Yeah. He was. And, and you power know, it, it was power shot in the grass and, and with a technique that, uh, if you remember, Brian, he kind of wanted us to keep it on the down low until we got through the Cayuga tournament. That's right. You know, he was thinking uh, he was thinking that was going to give him a good shot to win the tournament. And it's likely to because we see him. We see people winning with that technique around, you know, Lake Opakong and these lakes around our way. We see him doing it a lot. Yeah. Dude, Garrett's a hammer, man. He's like 25 years old. He's young. That's That is pretty amazing. How that long has he been amazing. doing this? This is his second year on the Elite Series. I think he only tried like one tr one time in the Opens and made it. Yeah, that's pretty strong. Yeah, he's, and, I, and I know his yeah. debut tournament in the Elites was a spectacular one. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, where he started out with a bang and maybe yep. – Join the Century Club, which uh, <laughs> very few people yeah. are part of that club. That's awesome, man! It's a uh, man. That's a dream right there. Yeah, no Can you met? I've I've never caught a hundred pounds. I've, I've been pretty close on some of those smallmouth lakes. If they were four day tournaments, yeah, they might, it might have got close. You know, where you're hitting those high or those mid twenties, but yeah, I've never I've never sniffed that hundred pound mark. I I must it must have been awesome. Yeah, yeah maybe same. maybe like yeah, my last four years combined, I caught a hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, New Jersey. Yeah, <laughs> we got to get we got to get you out of state. We got to get you on the Risby fishing tour, BTC. That's right. <laughs> BT, BTC B divorce tour. Let's let's wrap this up and take a quick commercial break, and we come back. We've got yeah. Let me get let me uh, let me give a few shout outs here on the message board. Go it's ahead. lighting up already. Um, our Bashu TV subscribers are in full force. Um, and by the way, guys. If you are over on Facebook and you're just over there kind of milling around, you're not going to come over. We're still going to hook you up with a prize if you like and share tonight's feed. So, uh, on your Facebook, like tonight's like tonight's show. I can't talk tonight, guys. <laughs> like tonight's show, share it, and we're going to enter your name into a drawing to win a Bash U TV official swag pack. That's a hat. That's a shirt. That's a buff. Um, so, like and share it over there. Um, Right now on the message board, we got our guys Richard Naver, Angelo, uh, Chuck and Fish, Jason, No Dale Jr., um, Eli, Dale, David Prince, Riz's Bent Prop Shaft, Andre, <laughs> <laughs> Tim, Bruce Miller, Kyle Preston, uh, and, and, and many more. So we appreciate you guys being here with us, and we're looking forward to a great show. We got a, we got a lot coming, guys. If you're just tuning in, we've got Garrett Paulquette. Coming with Chad Pipkins. We're going to be talking about clear water tactics, spawning smallmouth. And later in the show, we're going to be talking about some shallow grass Chesapeake Bay domination. So look for that all coming. We're going to take a quick break. Get on over there and subscribe to bashu.tv. Come check us out. We'll see you in just a few minutes. The micro jig rod from Cashin is not only a micro jig rod. It also works great for shaky heads, also works great for wacky worms, also works great for smaller finesse style swim baits. So seven foot one inch, medium action, fast taper. You want a workhorse spinning rod. You might want to look at the micro jig rod. I got one and then I had to, had to end up getting three or four. So the micro jig rod by Cashin, your next workhorse in your spinning rods. Every moment on the water not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together, the One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Tackle Warehouse is proud to sponsor the FLW Pro Circuit and is the official tackle retailer of FLW. Providing proven bass fishing gear as well as the newest and hottest tackle. Our friendly and knowledgeable customer service staff can help you every step of the way. 
and we offer free ground shipping on orders over $50. Tackle Warehouse, everything for the bass angler at the lowest prices. Guaranteed. I have to be constantly on the lookout for new techniques to stay on the top of my game. Giant. Some have been more Giant. successful oh God, than others. Giant. The finesse fingernail. It happens every time. The chain gang. Oh God. Ah, broke it off. The crow's nest. Never let go. And don't even get me started on tackle management, especially trying to stop rust and corrosion. Peanut butter. Hmm, I could. Motor oil. Gotta keep the rust off all these baits. WD-40. Gotta keep the rust off. Silica, toothpicks, Q-tips, the list goes on and on. I'm hard on tackle, I fish fast, I need my tackle organized and protected. I can't be worrying about losing baits to rust. And when it comes to tackle management, there's only one solution. Flambo tackle storage systems with Z-Rust technology. The original anti-rust tackle box. Uncompromised clarity. Renowned durability. The infused anti-rust option that is FDA safe and free of harmful chemicals. The organization options are endless, but there's only one. One box, one anti-corrosion technology, one family-owned American-made brand, Flambo Z-Rust Tackle Solutions. Preserve, perform, repeat. Look alive, Pete. Are, are we back? <laughs> We're <You're> back. back. <laughs> I was busy watching some of our other feeds. Welcome back, everybody, uh, to Bash University Live. Uh, glad you could be with us here tonight. Uh, we got a great show. We're going to be talking about one of the one of the funnest ways to fish. That if you've never experienced it, you want it. You want to do this sometime. It's it's when the bass starts when the small smallies start spawning. It, it's crazy fun and um, and it can also be frustrating. So we we've got two really really talented elite anglers with us tonight. We're, that's going to be our topic. We've got Garrett Paulquette. We've got Chad Pipkins, and we're also uh, happy to have GDP. Another elite angler in the studio with us tonight who is also very adept at this technique. So uh, we're going to be running around the horn. We're going to be learning about it. And we want to invite your questions uh, to come on over and, and, and help us learn about this, this amazing technique. And I also want to introduce you guys to Rod Warrior USA. This is uh, one of our new partners here at Bass University. They make an amazing rod cover and uh, joining us. Um, as part of the promotion, they're joining us. They're offering 15% off all their stuff over at rodwarriorusa.com. You can check this stuff out. One of the cool things about this rod cover, it's, it's made of neoprene. It, it's really protective of your gear, but it floats. So when you drive as fast as Greg De Palma does and a rod jumps out of the boat, you can just go back and pick it up. So check it out. 15% off. Use the code BASHU at Rod Warrior USA, and you'll be able to get your custom Bass U uh, rod wraps. We need one of those for a phone cover, Pete. <laughs> Ash University floating phone cover. Speaking yes. of that, shout out to our guy, Mike Reed, who put his phone on the bottom of Cedar Creek on his local lake yesterday. So he could have used a custom Bass U floating phone case. Rod That's right. It up. R rumor Rod has Warrior. it Mike Iaconelli sunk a phone yesterday as well. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I haven't yes. sunk one for quite a while, but I've everybody has lost one. Have you, I know you've lost one, BTC, right? Oh, yeah. No. I dropped one in the Delaware. Gone. Oh, that's a goner. That's a goner, baby. Gone. GDP? F. <laughs> I always put my phone up every time I get in the boat. The only pump, guy pump. in the history of fishing that has never lost a phone. I, I, lost, I lost mine in mid conversation with my wife in the in the uh, with the Alabama Delta. What's it called? That Alabama River Delta. Just going right down into the salt water with the crabs. Um, Dude, uh, Pete, a couple years ago, I was fishing a Thursday nighter with uh, Eric, the intern, and um, 
about 40 minutes into the event, I, uh, it was a six to nine tournament on Thursday night. I called my wife to check in cause I hadn't talked to her all day. And as I'm talking to her, I hook up with one. So I'm like, honey, I got a fish. I got to go. And instead of placing it down, I was excited and I, I spiked it like a football. I threw the phone down on the deck and went bloop, right in the drink. <laughs> and the we fish throw didn't jump off. Down. Yeah. It's like, honey, I got one. Bam. <laughs> and lost the fish to boot. And then the fish jumped off. Man. But at, it, at any rate, it was an yep. exciting evening. So yep. I'm going to bring in our guests of the evening. Excellent. I lost mine. I was trying to hold it against my life jacket as I was putting my boat on the trailer. Oh, it's like in an instant, it just the, in an instant, it's gone, boom, off the deck, in the water. And uh, and I'm sure some of these guys have done that, too. But it's good to have them. I want to I want to welcome these guys to two of my guys. appreciate you being with us tonight. We got two elite series anglers. We got Chad Pipkins. We got Garrett. Paul yeah. Pitt. Good to have How's you with us, guys. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's great. great to have you guys here. Let, where, where are you guys? Let me start with you, Garrett. Are you, are you guys at home? Are you on the road? Where are I, you, Garrett? I am at home. I'm, uh, I live right outside of Detroit. And obviously, as you guys probably know from the news, it's been a coronavirus hotbed. So mm -hmm. I've been locked down here for the last three or four months, just kind of uh, you know trying to stay inside, stay safe, fish a little bit while I can. And currently, I'm packing up at my truck as we speak. And getting ready to to get down south and finally start our season again so i'm excited uh that's that's uh i know we're dealing with it too we're in the hot bed right here in my yeah. part of the country so we're stuck inside and uh i'm looking forward to getting my season kicked off here pretty soon too but uh chad where where, where are you are you at home too i am at, at home too we got lucky and uh we we finished our house the day that started we did a trunk closing in the garage of our or that car of our realtor and moved in the day after everything happened. So lucky for me, I'd be going crazy because we've been stuck in the house, but been able to do tons of projects and stuff. And I got a four month old baby. So been able to stay home, watch her grow up. She's doubled her weight. She's now bigger than my biggest bass. So we've got a new personal bass to hunt. Now, so it's, uh, it's been good timing actually. Man, that, that's great. That's exciting news. Are, are you, are, did you, uh, did you stay at, you know, up north, Chad, did you move down to Lake Gunnersville with everybody else? Would you, what did nah, you do? No, yeah, I, I like Michigan. Man. I love the season. So uh, I got a lot of work stuff that goes on here. So we just kind of slid over 15 minutes up uh, in a little smaller town to wit. I can actually have a garage drive my boat in now, which is nice. So I can hone the tackle and, and try to keep my stuff up and be ready to roll when we get down south. But uh, we're going to live in Michigan, I think, for a while. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool with your, with your garage there. I think he's big time in this, guys. Now, I don't know about that. It, I <laughs> built the garage, and I'm an idiot because it barely fits. You think you'd have some common sense and make it a little, maybe a little extra, but that that didn't happen. <laughs> you, you can never go big enough, man. That's no, the facts. It's foolish. Yeah. Do you have to use your swing away tongue, or I don't. But I got. I'm, I'm going to put it through the wall at some point. I got like four <laughs> inches, six inches on the back, and maybe four or five on the front. But I guarantee you, we all fish. We get tired when I come home late. I'm not going to double check until it stops and it'll be in the drywall. <laughs> Get the spackle out, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> I don't spackle. <laughs> hey, a I lot of guys so put uh, tire chocks permanently in their concrete so that they don't make that mistake. Ooh, you know, I, I've been thinking about it. That's not a bad idea. It's something I like. Yeah. Yeah. Give you, give you something to hit. I already, I tire. already learned something. We've been here for 10 minutes. I've already learned something. That's what we do at the Bass University. <laughs> <laughs> uh well, well you know what i learned and I, I didn't know this but you um you know we've been working with gdp for a while now but i, I didn't realize that all you guys are buds and and you uh you do some traveling together out on tour is that isn't that right gdp oh yeah man and a lot more <laughs> <laughs> oh geez what do you in mean a good way that? in a good way <laughs> <laughs> what kind of show is this <laughs> that's right i slept at chad's house before <laughs> How long have you guys been traveling together? It before the elites, or uh, or did you guys start doing it once you got out on the elites? Well, this is yeah, this is our, yeah. Go ahead, Garrett. You're the guest. I'll, okay, I was gonna say. Well, I started traveling the elites last year. It was my first year. I I was traveling by myself actually uh, for the first two events. I didn't really know anybody, and Chad actually reached out to me and was like, "Hey, man, you know, I know this isn't easy doing it by yourself. So come and stay with us." Which Worked out perfect, saved me a bunch of money, got to meet. I didn't really know him from before. Obviously, I knew who he was, but we never really met. Um, 
which is kind of funny growing up in the same state. But so I got I started traveling with him uh, at the third tournament, and then Greg, you were near the end of the season, I want to say. Yep. Ten Killer maybe was the first one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and then you came along, and now we're going strong for the season. So yeah, I've known Chad now for how long, Chad? It's been a while. Some sometime back in the opens, probably like ten yeah. years ago. I don't know. Yeah, it's been a little while. Time flies. Yep. I'm curious, Chad, this question goes to you. Why not with someone like Garrett, like haze him and, and make it hard on him? <laughs> well, we haven't got there yet. We're just, you have to earn, we have to get, you know, get him to trust you first. Then you can start making some stuff. So you're kind of ruining my plan. <laughs> we'll see. Be on the lookout, Garrett. <laughs> be, be on the lookout. There's going to be some maybe dead catfish in your live wells. <laughs> That's the funny, funny, funny you call him that. Because Chad, what do you call him? A catfish or something? For catfish. Yeah, catfish. For catfish. He's, got some, he's got some pet names, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> Good. Well, you, you, you need – well, you learn. It's so much uh, – honestly, I traveled for a lot of years, and uh, I had a blast. I, I, I traveled with Ike for almost 10 years, and it really matters who you travel with. Like, it, it makes the experience a, a lot better. Um, at, at least that's my experience with it. Sure. Yeah, de- definitely. And you take up, you kind of take like each other's personalities. Like Chad's a real positive guy. I mean, he could go out there and not catch a bass and he's still coming in and saying, Oh man, I'm excited. I'm going to catch him tomorrow. I'm going to figure it out. And that's kind of infectious. Whereas I'm someone that can get down on myself. So when you, when you surround yourself with positive people and Greg's the same way, always positive, it, it, you know, it brings your game up and makes it a lot easier to, to be on the road away from everything and continue to work hard in tough times. Yeah, I mean, fishing is – nobody's, like, going to win tournaments because they're better at casting. They're better at, like, 99% of the time it's it's the mental aspect. And if you're, you know, down in the dumps and you're rooming by yourself and you're just your, – you could be your own worst enemy at times. But if you have a good group of people and, and you're able to have a little fun, you know, when you're back back rigging, having a, having a beer or whatever, eating dinner, just kind of talking through the day, you don't need to share spots to help each other out. Sometimes it's just like Garrett was talking, a mental thing but then just getting clued in on something different. You know, you go out with a different different mentality and, and kind of get on things quicker, and uh, it can can save your butt sometimes for sure. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. It it, it really does matter. Uh, and mentally, like you guys said, sharing some patterns can be really, really helpful. Do you guys like do like the Johnson brothers where you share money? You know, you guys split it in three <laughs> ways. How do you guys working that out? I share food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Greg only eats pasta, so that's all he accepts yeah. for monetary. Literally, Italian pasta. baby. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a cheap date, GDP. Yeah. That's right, man. Dollar box. <laughs> it's a pound. What do you mean? He said he said box for the first time ever. I've never heard him say that. He learned. I he taught me that you eat pasta by pounds. How many pounds you want? Like one or two pounds? The hell's a pound? That, how's that possible? You're consuming all those carbs, GDP. You look like you weigh 150 pounds. I don't know. I had I had a big piece of steak tonight and a whole pound of pasta nice. for dinner. <laughs> fine specimen you are. Yes, wow. Brian. I mean, that yeah. metabolism. Brian, do you say pasta by the pound or how do you say it? Uh, I don't know. I just eat it. I just boil the water and put it in. That's right. Yeah, but you got to you got to <laughs> regulate it by somehow. You got to say we always say how many pounds do you want to cook? Yeah, I don't know. I just I, I don't really do the cooking part. I just kind of eat it. Oh, Dang, he says I'm a baller. Yeah, he says, yeah, I was like, yo, let me get, fill it up, man. <laughs> nice. Well, I, you know, as much as I'd like to continue to talk about pasta, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to, diversity. We're going to dive in, man. We're going to, uh, we're, we're talking about a really cool thing. And I said it uh, before you guys came on. It's one of my funnest things to do is to, is to bed fish uh, when the smallies, you know, take the beds. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot easier than some people might think it is. It's nothing like largemouth, but, uh, but, but it's a lot of fun. Are you guys doing that yet up where you're at, or is it a little too early? Um, it's, it's lake by lake. I'd say probably maybe 60, 70% of our smallmouth fisheries it's happening right now. And then there's another portion of them that it's still too cold. I don't want to say it's too cold. Like the water temperature is in the 60s now, but it's warmed up so fast that the fish kind of haven't made that uh, transition to get on the bed. 
but it's definitely, I mean, like right now on most of our lakes, it's prime time. I know guys that are catching 30 pounds off of beds, which is crazy, but it's just been like a perfect warm up where every single fish has come up instead of coming in waves like they normally do. And I think within like the next week, when our tournaments wow. start up here, you're going to see like some, I mean, unbelievable weights coming out of these lakes, which is pretty exciting. But it's, yeah. it's happening right now. I mean, literally as we that's, speak. That, that's just horrible that you have to endure <laughs> that right now. But yeah. we got to leave, remember? We're leaving <laughs> like next week, right when it, yeah, how it goes. That, that, that is how it goes. So you're, you're, are you in the same zone uh, where they're just – Getting up yeah, in the bank. I'm just west of Garrett, probably an hour and a half. So we, we would fish the same lakes. I and mean, I grew up fishing the BFLs and stuff up north. And usually, depending on the winter, like they peak, you know, the, the last two weeks in May are usually mm -hmm. when they're up and active. And you can catch them when they're not on bed, but you can catch them jerking and swim baiting and cranking and stuff. And it's just stupid fun. And then they, they usually start to lock down that last week of May. First week of June is probably the, some of the best and, and biggest for sure. Right. Well, it's, it's coming, and I know we've got a ton of questions for you guys. Riz is giving me some baseball signals over there. Uh, what do we got for these guys, Riz? We have a lot. Um, I'm going to start it off with, uh, with, with Tim, and Tim wants to know what the biggest difference that you guys take, that you're, the biggest difference in the approach that you take to fishing for small mouth on beds as opposed to large mouth on beds. And Tim, you won yourself a bag of missile forty eights. All right, you awesome. want me to go? You well, ready? yeah, we'll start. We'll it. start with you. Why not, Chad? Sure. I, I'd say the biggest difference, uh, in t especially tournament fishing with smallmouth, is it's totally different. Like in largemouth, you really want to catch the female, and like you want that that big pair. I mean, sometimes there's a big male up there, but often you're, you're trying to figure out what you want to be there right when the fish are moving up because you want to catch the female with smallmouth fishing. Like, especially up north, our big fish, I, I can't even tell. I don't even know if I've ever caught a single pair. I mean, I've caught 30 pounds off smallmouth on bed, but they're they're males. I mean, they've been on there for seven to 10 days, and they're 20, 25-year-old fish. And you can actually find the exact fish you want to catch, you know, two, three, four days before the tournament, and they're still going to be there. Versus that largemouth, you, you almost need to be in – you maybe have some starting fish, but you want to be in the right areas looking for the right thing. And, like, when we were at uh, Hartwell last year, I would go down a, a – creek pocket that I went down two days before where they weren't spawning. And that's where I had my best bag because they moved up and they made beds and there was, you know, active pairs and versus smallmouth. Like you, you kind of already have them picked out. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> that that's made. What's your experience, Garrett? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's the truth. You're fishing for males most of the time, but I think the approach a lot of times is different. Whereas large mouth, it's all about stealth. You know, sometimes you got to use a push pull, and if you put the troll motor on, they're not going to bite for an hour, things like that. You know, smallmouth fishing on beds is a lot of times is just real aggressive. I mean, I'll have the troll motor on 10 at all times I'm looking. And if I run them over in four foot of water, you can turn the boat around and, and catch them a lot of times. I mean, you can idle over them with a the big motor. We do that a lot. Just idle until you see them and then, then turn and start fishing. So it's not necessarily as a stealthy just because they're, they're just such an aggressive fish by nature. Um, so you don't have to kind of like take your time and, and work through an area really slow. I mean, you go, go, go. And it's just all about covering water until you see them and then start fishing for them. That, that is amazing. I mean, they're, they're just 10 times more aggressive than largemouth. They are definitely until they don't want to be, then you can sit on them and they'll just, they won't move. I've, I've seen fish that are like 12 feet under the boat and they are like this and your bait hits them everywhere and they literally do not budge. And it's a it's crazy. Uh, they've been there for seven, 10 days and they're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not eating anything today. So. They're, I, you know, I have never seen that. I have never seen a small mouth go cross-eyed like that. Yeah. How do you, it's, how it's usually not the shallow ones. Like my technique for catching them in tournaments is find the fish that other people don't see. So right. I like to get out a little deeper and float around with that stupid flogger and, and, and literally find them in, you know, 10 to 20 foot of water. And a lot of times you can go to those fish at noon after, 200 boats of fish and they're still sitting there ready to bite, but it's still, I think, I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm pretty sure it's just the time they've been on the bed. Like after they've been up seven to 10 days, there's a time period when they don't chase or do anything. And there's certain times you literally can drop a bait and watch and work it all over their head and they won't bite. It's, it's not often, but I have left a couple, you know, like six plus pounders that maybe I skin hooked once cause I finally got them to bite. And then I, I came back to them two, three times and, and never could catch them. Like in, in those same, you know, BFL tournaments. So wow. I got well, a couple that left me. You, you got, you said, you guys said something about the males and females. Have you noticed like 
you know, what's the deal with the males and the females on the smallmouth? Or does the, the female stay? Does she roll, roll out quick? Or is the male who's left? Or who, who are you? What are you fishing for? The males or the females or, or both? For my experience, I mean, if, if you get the, the female, it's just like a, a true blessing. I mean, I, I think, I don't know about you, Chad, they must come up for just a few hours. I mean, they come up, you'll see them rolling and then they're gone. I, I've never really seen them sitting around defending the bed at all together. I okay. think that's all the males. So I think the male comes up, you know, kind of fans it out, gets it ready. And then the female comes in for a little bit, drops the eggs, and then they're gone. And if you, if you happen to be there while the female is doing it, I mean, you might catch them out of kind of, I don't want to say luck, but out of chance. But most of the time they're extremely skittish. And, you know, you kind of, when I see that, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I usually kind of give up quick on them and move on to a fish that's maybe more ready to bite. Yeah. And I don't think that the difference, I don't think the size is different. Like I've seen pairs, and but again, like Garrett said, I've only out of years of smallmouth fishing for beds, I, I can probably count on two hands how many pairs I've actually seen. I've seen a couple pairs up North here and at Champlain one, one time they were moving up. I saw maybe six or eight pairs, but I never saw the female that was really much bigger than the male. So it's, I don't know if that's a fact that maybe they just, it's not like the large mouth of the females dwarfs the males. You know, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I just, I've never seen it where the female is the big one that's up there and going crazy. You know, it's just, I've never even caught a female and I've caught, like I said, lots of 25, 30 pound bags of smallmouth. So. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. I, I never really put that together. I don't get to do it probably as near as often as you guys do. And I never, I never considered that, but uh, that's interesting that those females are, are going and I, and you're, you know, as I, as you say that, I'm trying to, I, I'm like, I know I had to have fish pairs before, but I can't recall yeah. you know, seeing that, you know. It's funny when you think about, like, we catch the big ones, you know, when they're up pre-spawn, and, and I want to say they're females always because they usually are, but then you go to those same lakes and you catch those giant, you know, five and a half to seven pounders, and they've been, and I've seen them on the bed for seven to ten days, and I know they're not a female when they've been on the bed for ten days, you know, so it's. Right, um, right. <laughs> That's a big, big male bass, Riz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got another question for these boys, Rich? I sure do. Um, our subscriber DL133, he goes smallmouth fishing quite often, and he does not have electronics on his boat. What's the best way for him to find uh, good bedding areas for smallmouth? Great question. Why don't you take that one first, Garrett? Because yeah. we went to Chad last. Yeah, not to be cliche, cover water. You want to cover water. Um, I don't know what kind of lake you're fishing. Usually spawning fish, in my experience, if you have like a gravel or a small rock present in the lake, that's like the premier area for them to bed. So I'm going to I'm gonna start buzzing around. I'm going to go usually as deep as I can see, um, and then I'll kind of zig back, zig back and forth. You know, I'll go up to two foot, and I'll go out as deep as I can see, just like that down the shorelines, um, looking for something. And the biggest thing is you just want to establish – usually one bed what you're looking for and a, a lot of it um is different based off color like you'll you'll notice a lot of these lakes will have really bright blue beds or, or bright yellow beds or sometimes it's a really dark just a little hole i mean almost the size of the fish where the fish is like almost dwarfing the bed um, but you really need to cover water and just try to figure out one little clue see one bed see where one's sitting and when you do that you just try to duplicate it so you know, you're looking for things on the bank that will give you a clue whether there's reeds around or if it's on a point, things like that. And then you just, just duplicate it from there. But, but the biggest thing is just to cover water and, and get that first clue. And once you find that, usually you can continue to find more pretty quickly. Great, great advice. How about you, Chad? Yeah, and for sure. And, and to expand on that, like once you find them, it's you, you cover water until you find the right area. So you want to get around that hard bottom, that sand, gravel, rock mix. They definitely like that, those small like pebbles and grass. It's not just big boulders. There's a field of all big boulders. Like they want stuff that's flat too. They want those isolated boulders that have the gravel mixed in. So you definitely want that combination. And then the big thing is when you find them, then you need to slow down. Smallmouth are a lot like bluegill. Like I don't think I have ever seen one or two smallmouth spawning. Like it's always like five, 10, 20, like they're in packs. So like I, we were at thousand islands before and you know, I had the eight or 10 big smallmouth that I wanted to catch marked and my co-angler is just throwing his stuff out the back, like being a nice guy. And I think the first day he caught three giants that I didn't even see, you know? So it's like, if you spend the time and really start zigging and zagging and dissecting, once you find those areas, you're probably going to find some more of those like key fish that you you'd want to target during the tournament. 
Do you get a chance to fish for spawners, GDP, uh, small as much? Yeah, I'll tell you what, Garrett, Garrett kind of hit the nail on the head when he said, uh, once you there's like the beds, like the, I remember the first time I really went true smallmouth spawn fishing, it was on Champlain. And once my eyes got adjusted to looking for that bright glow, dude, it was a game changer. Like I knew exactly what I was looking for and it applies for largemouth too, depending on where you're at. But that's a, that's a big clue right there. Cause a lot of guys will go down and back like, ah, I never saw any spawners. You, you almost have to, you know, adjust your eye to see it, especially if they're out a little bit deeper, you know, if you're not flogging. So that's a, that's a pretty big clue. I think I, it is. I agree. And yeah. one, you know, and you guys kind of all touched on this, but I've done this, uh, quite a bit guys in, and you know, you, the boulder, the, it's not a big boulder, but it's a little boulder amongst the gravel. It seems like there's always a bed there, you know, <laughs> um, and, uh, what you, what you can do sometimes like, and I've used this a lot in tournaments, especially like you always get wind, you can't hold as good. And what, what you can do is you can actually go through an area and just identify the boulder, the little football size boulder and just throw at it. And that's, that's what I've, been able to how i've been able to survive and catch those spawners just by targeting the boulders yeah or whatever else habitat like the maybe the blue spots that that certainly would be a great target but but and and one of the interesting things that has helped me a lot is the waves actually sometimes can help you get better depth penetration oh yeah you can, you can see getting at an angle instead of having to look through the flat surface exactly yep. right. definitely definitely yeah yeah. So long as the waves don't muddy up the water or muck it up somehow, right? You know, and a lot of these lakes are uh, are dark, are clear and rocky, and they don't. But but well, you've you've talked about this, Chad, uh, and it's amazing because I see guys using it. and I have very limited experience, and you talk about using a, a crazy uh, construction cone device that uh, that that's called a flogger, and it it oh you brought it. <laughs> <laughs> never leave home without it the stanley yeah. cup <laughs> yeah if we ever have an elite series tournament when it's peak smallmouth spawn season it's not the only thing we're going to be hoisting up come on that's right <laughs> <laughs> and, and i noticed yours is black that's that's unique yeah it's it's the same other one they're just after they, they let in a lot of light and the black helps a bunch i've also got um, some black eyes and bloody lips. So I put a, I tape like a shirt around it too. <laughs> when, when you find the right area, like you, li I literally float around. I mean, I've found so many 30 pound bags of fish up and up North, just floating around people and, and spending the time. Like everybody wants to just fish. I used to go up there for three or four days. And when I got in the right areas, if it was rough and windy and I couldn't see, I would literally just put out drift socks and float and make floats. And I would find them. I'd buoy them. Then I'd go back and mark the rock they were next to or whatever. And that way, when the tournament starts, I was ready to go. I had enough for me to catch 25 to 30 for my co-angler to win and catch, you know, 20 to 25. And it makes, it makes, it's a lot of work, but it makes for a lot of fun. And the, the, before we got the flogger thing going, the first BFL I won, I won with a snorkel. That was the year before the flogger started. And we used to, I remember floating over it and then going back and then like, oh, she changed, you know, she changed directions. But I spent a lot of practice literally with the snorkel mask and just floating around. So. Wow, I never, I never a little that. bit better so <laughs> little bit better i mean are you, you like snorkeling you're out swimming around or are you trying no, to just <laughs> floating it was the water was too cold <laughs> that first year it was in the 50s and they were spawning deep so i would literally just stick my head in the water and float around on the back of the boat and have my snorkel out and then mark them with the you know the little floating buoys or whatever and then go back and mark them so wow. and we found that flogger overseas and ordered a few of them and for a while there, we were actually getting commissioned. Me and a couple of buddies that Ryan said that I used to fish with and Jeff Cox, we get like 10 bucks for every one they sold because we got some distribution rights to somebody uh, with through Poor Boys and Lurecraft. And yeah, we should have done a little more research for that because we don't do that anymore or get any more money and they still sell them, I think. But it is what it is. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing. It's so simple when you think about it. Uh, but you know what I've been looking for? And there hasn't been really advancements because – like you said, it's a pain in the neck to literally a pain in the neck yeah. to lean, to lean over and look through that thing for long periods of time. It is. And I, I'm sorry, but we, I talked about it before. Like, why not make one that like all the little things I've done to mine, like you can make it. And I feel like you can make it super easy, but it's just, it's just one of those things where you gotta have the time to do it and stuff. And I think you could make some advancements, but regardless of how you make it, 
I think you're still going to have to lay down on the, on the front deck, stand up, stand out. I mean, my knees would like, I'd have a bloody knee and like a look like I got a fight when I was done with the fishing tournament. And I don't think there's a way to really make that flogger like taller. So you don't have to do anything with it still being as effective as it is when you get right down, when you push the cone right down in the water, you're, you're down there a foot further, it blocks more light but it's harder to keep it down and it's more likely to pop up and hit your face, but that's the best way. And you can actually take it instead of looking just down, you can actually take it like you guys were talking about looking in a wave. Well, it's like having your head underwater and turning the flogger and you can, I, it's not just looking underneath the boat. I'm, I can see in a 30, 40 foot circle and you can just pick things apart, like super, super easy. <laughs> well, that, that being said, right, you're, you're deep fishing, you're f deep flogging. You've identified a, a, a a couple of fish in 20 feet of water. How, how are you executing on that, that catch? Because, you know, you're, you're making the waypoints. How are you coming back and, and catching that fish when you need to? For sure. And I, I learned from experience because the first one I, I didn't win because my co caught it by accident. Cause I thought I knew where the bed was and mm -hmm. I was slowly trolling over to it and he was just fishing off the side. And that was a really aggressive one. And the fish went and it hit, ate his bait. So now when it's a tournament and I've got another guy in my boat, I have a conversation with him. I'm, I'm like, you're going to catch him too. Just please, if you can not cast for the fish that I'm fishing for, and I actually go up and they'll wait for me or I'll buoy one first. Like I'll drive over and actually drop a buoy on them and then troll back to the buoy. And then I want to visually see the fish before I cast to it. Cause those big ones, like sometimes they grab the bait and it's swimming away with it out, out of their mouth. I want to make 100% sure that if it's the fish I want to catch and it's five and a half to seven pounds, I want to make sure that entire bait is gone. If that fish is swimming away and I see any bit of my little white bait or yell or whatever bait I'm throwing, I'm not setting the hooks. They're going to bite again, you know? So I want to make sure that I'm getting a hook in the mouth and that that's helped me out a lot. Cause like I said, I've only left a couple on the bed, but it's after they were, they've been on there a long time. I actually skin hooked them a couple times, pulled them up to the surface and lost them and they go back down. But I haven't, you know, fortunately I haven't snagged any of them. Haven't had any co-angler mishaps where they're being nice, but they catch the fish because I make a mistake and I'm fishing the wrong fish, you know. So just just paying attention to detail, making sure you're catching the fish that you're supposed to catch. That's so, that's that's interesting. Do you guys GDP or Garrett? Do you guys have any interesting or unique methods to uh, getting no. on top of them deep water fish that you've marked? I mean, personally, I've only flogged one time on one fish ever. But Chad, the, the question I got for you and Garrett too. How did you do all this without spot lock back then? I was just going to say spot lock. <laughs> like, I don't know how Chad, you guys Chad, did it. you do that. I always fish team tournaments with us. So <laughs> I just had my buddy sit on the deck and he Jeez. told me when to set the hook. So Chad, you <laughs> go. You guys posted the video of me. That was in uh, yep. Waddington, I think. And I don't even, I don't remember if I had, I think that was before I had spot lock. Yeah, I that was spot, pre spot lock, man. That was the first yeah, thing. You can, like, and spot that was pre spot lock and one mile an hour current and two foot waves. So like you literally have to have the bed marked with a buoy because there are sometimes that one in particular was hard to see. And I would troll up past the buoy and wow. then you have that little window instead of like just floating back, you have that window where you start to slow down. And I would try to make that, that where I would start to slow down right near the bed. So I, that fish was not aggressive at all. And it was sitting tight. So I would kind of ease up and then I could get my bait in there for maybe, you know, seven to 10 seconds. And then I would be too far back and you're trying wow. to run the flogger floats when it's balancing in the water. So you can flog and, and sorry, you can see both hands. You can flog like this, but then you can let the flogger float for a couple seconds and put your left hand on the trolling motor, run your trolling motor real quick <laughs> and then grab the flogger again and set the hook and get out. So quick question for you. I think it was on Champlain, maybe two, three years ago, the guys were using really short rods. Is that something you do too when you're flogging? I haven't. And that would, that would make sense too. Yeah. yeah. If we did, if we had another one, like we were talking, I would definitely have, you know, a six or six and a half foot instead of that, you know, seven foot. It, okay. it would make it easier because that, that does get tough because your, your bait's out, you know, five feet away from you. You're trying to bring your rod back in this way. So that would definitely help. So now that you have the Ultrex, are you like using a, the remote control or uh, you, you haven't gone to that yet? We haven't got to flog it. The, the hard part is it, it's still, you know, you're, you're spot locked. And if, if it was an elite event and you could spot lock above it where the back of the boat is there, I mean, that would be perfect because the back of the boat doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. I mean, it would be amazing. But the difference is if you're in the front and you spot lock and it's, it's kind of catch up or jerk, that, that could be tough too because then you can't control when it's slow and when it's moving. Right. Um, I'd go to the back of the boat. Yeah. That's tricky stuff. We all, yeah. Do you guys ever use the floggers for largemouth scenarios? 
I haven't. I have not, no. I just, they're probably just a little too spooky to get on top of them and catch them like that. I've looked at some, but they, the minute you throw a bait in there, they kind of take off. Don't come yeah. back until you leave. A lot of the places right. they're going, they're not really spawning uh, deep enough, too. There was one lake yeah. in Michigan, Garrett probably know Lake Nepissing. Yeah. There was yep. a tournament a long time ago. They were spawning on like a grass sand edge and like 10 or 12 feet. And looking back, I remember I could see the big sand spots. And I feel like that might have been, if there was ever a time to catch a largemouth with a flogger, that. That might have been one, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was throwing a little craw and a spin reel, and they bit. So, Pete, Pete, remember that time you used a flogger to help Washington cross the Delaware? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of rocks there, and you got to be careful. <laughs> this, is, this is true. So, <laughs> good, good work, Pete. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Appreciate you. <laughs> you guys are watching uh, Bash U TV live. Uh, I want to. Invite you guys, if you haven't subscribed, it's 30 days or it's 50 days free right now. Go over to bashu.tv and we have a great top order promotion going on right now where you get a couple uh, Berkeley top order baits, including the El Chapo, uh, if you subscribe annually at bashu.tv. Riz, I know you're lit up over there. What do you got for us next? First thing I want to remind everybody on Facebook, also like and share the feed. Get your chance to win a Bashu official swag pack. And on the topic of river fishing, um, Andre wants to know some of your specific techniques and ways you, you, you catch these spawning smallmouth on river systems, specifically. Who's up? Go Chad, you're up. Oh, all right. Um, d d depending on, like, the St. Lawrence is a river, so it depends on which kind of river you're talking about. Up there, deep, clear water, it's really similar to uh, – you know, lake fishing up there, those smallmouth, it's crazy. You'd think they need to not be in the current, but they're, they're wild. I mean, it, the current has no impact on them. I, some of the best beds I've found up at thousand islands and I bet they're right in the current and I, maybe they dig just big enough hole where they're out of the current, you know, that beds deep enough, but they're it's, it's the key is when you find the right rock and gravel mix, you know, if, if you can find a flat area that has a lot of that, I feel like more fish can get in those areas because they have more to offer, but they're on all those, humps and bars out on the St. Lawrence river. And it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. As far as like river fishing is concerned, I think those fish like a Southern smallmouth in a river is definitely different than a Northern smallmouth. They're, they're they act a lot more like a large mouth. And our, our smallmouth up North, like, like calm and sunny weather and large mouth and smallmouth down South, they like, you know, low pressure, you know, that rain and that, that cloudy kind of stuff. And I think the smallmouth down there relate more like largemouth where they're going to spawn in that slack water. They spawn on lay downs and stuff. We've got a little river by the house called grand river and they're in those, they're kind of like little eddies, anything that comes out in an eddy little backwater area with a lay down or, or a pile of rocks. They're on all those little flats and those places where the current's a little less. How about you Garrett? Yeah, you yeah, you, systems? yeah. You pretty much hit it on a nail on the head right there. Um, the one thing I'll add, add is, like I know, and I haven't spent a lot of time down south doing this. I mean, the times we go to some of the smallmouth lakes down there is just not during the spawn. But um, like I know a big deal is flats around islands. Usually usually that's a lot of hard bottom just because the current's rolling into an island and rolling around it. And you get a lot of boulders and a lot of rocks. Like I know it's a deal on Fort Loudon and Teleco. Um, and you'll get those smallmouth that spawn right on the main lake. But just, um, you know, when you think of smallmouth and current, don't uh, – don't think they need a lot of slack water to spawn. I mean, they literally need a rock. And that's funny. Chad said that like I was at the St. Lawrence last year around July, watching them spawn in the current and they're sitting down there, even, even though they're behind a rock, I mean, they're swimming as fast as they can just to stay on the bed. It's, it's pretty amazing. So as long as there's any so kind of, up. yeah, as long yeah, as there's right. any kind of obstruction <laughs> in the water, they will get behind it and they will make their bed. I don't know how, but they do. Man, that, that's amazing. That's really interesting. I know down on the Tennessee River and some of those tail races, I've heard the guys talk about that same scenario where they've uh, they've seen them behind the boulder or caught them behind the boulders uh, mm -hmm. spawning in, the, in that same capacity. What a cool description. Though. I can't imagine watching a fish on the bed just swimming as hard as he can just to stay there. Yeah, if you got crazy. to spawn once a year, you'd make it work too. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm Brian. laughs> we, we all have proven that from time to time, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Chad, Garrett, is there any, like, you know, for you guys, obviously I'm guessing you guys are more or less drop shot more than anything, right, on these spawning fish? Yeah. For the most part. Is there, yeah. is there any kind of, like, adjustments you guys are doing leader length-wise with spawning fish or, or actual, you know, 
some special bait you guys want to share? Yeah, I got a, I got a little rig here. Um, I mean, this is your basic drop shot weight hook. Um, as far as like length, I don't, I don't go terribly short. I'll keep it around 10 inches on average. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and measure it eight inches, 12 inches, something like that. I feel like a smallmouth is really threatened when the bait is right in their face or even just a little bit above them. So I don't do like a three inch drop. I mean, most of the time I, I stay with your typical, you know, average drop shot, I guess. Um, and the baits I'm throwing, I, I'm not throwing anything real long. Like I'm not going to throw a six inch worm, uh, or anything real small. It's, it's mostly your compact goby style baits. I guess you could say this is a little smally smasher from big bite. It's a three and a half inch bait. It's a perfect size. Um, they have one here in a four and a half inch, which I kind of stray away from them just because I, I want to have full control of the bait. And I want it to get down into the bed and do exactly what I want. Whereas when you go to a four inch, a five inch, six inch bait, you know, you start drifting around and you don't have as much control of the bait to just shoot it to the bottom, keep it in there and, and hold it. Um, when I'm doing the flogging thing, like we were talking about, I'm going with a bright bait most of the time, or at least I'm starting with it just because it's easier to see. Cause you'd be surprised when it's down there, 15 foot, a little translucent color like this, it gets lost pretty quick. And a lot of times the fish already have your bait and, and, you know, you're kind of looking seeing where it's at and the fish has already pulled out of the bed and dropped it. So hmm. I always start with a bright bait. And then if I'm fishing more so like looking at the spots, like the sand spots that have the beds, I'm not actually sight fishing the fish. I'm always going with a natural color, green, smoke, purple, something like that. Um, you know, one thing that to get a little more technical is that on my drop shot weights, I always go with black just because I've seen in deep water, when you drop down on them, they will actually attack this weight because they're so aggressive. First, a lot of times if it's silver, I think they think it's like a little bait fish and the black seems to get rid of that. So you, you won't drop down and have them grab the weight right away and take it off. So I, I go with black and then this hook here is not like your typical drop shot hook, I guess you could say. It's more of a J hook style, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. This is a little stinger hook by Gamagatsu and you kind of hear the horror stories of guys having a big fish fighting it for a couple minutes and having it pull off. And a lot of times that we're just using hooks where the shank is too short and it's hooking them in the lip barely. Whereas if you go to that hook with the longer shank here, you will hook them, you know, a half inch into their mouth and it's very rare to lose a fish. Once you hook them, if you just back your drag off and play them right. So those are the, that's my main thing. I mean, if, if I'm in fishing and reeds, uh, really like heavy grass. I might go to a Texas rig, but I'm always starting with a drop shot. I feel like it's the best way to get a bite. And then it's the highest percentage to land the fish. For sure. that, is that same with you, Chad? Yeah, real. real most of that's just dead on. Uh, the only thing I'll add to that too is with that drop shot. Um, the reason it's so effective is when you're fishing deep, it is hard. Like if you have a co-angler in the back of the boat and you say, Hey, throw out that light spot. I mean, it'll take them 10 or 15 casts to actually hit it because it just it's different the perception is different when you're looking at something that's five or ten feet away from the boat that's 15 feet deep so if you hit the target you actually need to cast 15 feet past the target in order to get your bait to come back down you know or if, if you're not letting your line out right so the drop shot is one of the baits that actually falls perfectly straight and it allows you to control the bait and move the bait um, one difference that I would do is when I'm drop shot and I always have both. I have like Garrett said, just your standard drop shot, but I always have one on the deck. That's like, I call it like the width of a fish, you know, that five inches for those big ones that are real tall. It, because some of those fish, maybe you guys haven't seen them, but I've seen plenty where they just sit and they literally do not eat anything and you can put it on anywhere around and they won't touch it. And every once in a while, like you need that weight to just be perfect. Then you can keep that length. And the bait is right in front of their nose. And even with it right in front of their nose, there's oftentimes like that one fish I was telling you, the one that got away. <laughs> I, <laughs> I could not get that fish to bite a drop shot. But after I, I got a tube down there, like a half ounce tube, and was able to, you know, just kind of hit underneath the gills and get that fish. It, it, it literally didn't even move. It just started to flare, you know, flared the gill a little bit open. And as soon as I saw that fish open her mouth once, I reeled my tube up put that rod down, drop my drop shot down. And it ate it as soon as it touched its nose. Now I lost that fish, but like that was key in getting the fish to bite, like recognizing like it was that it was getting riled up by the tube. Like it actually mouthed the tentacles of the tube, but it wasn't aggressive enough to eat the tube. So once, you know, I got the fish fired up, I knew it would eat my little teeny drop shot, like a little, it's like a little one inch fly worm looking thing. And 
you know, it's just one of those things. If you can recognize those, you can capitalize on some of those fish that maybe are left behind, you know, after other guys work them. Wow. Well, you guys use um, light line for this or, or, or because the fish are aggressive on the beds, do you, do you scale up on your drop shot? Um, I, I, don't I, really, uh, go I don't really scale up or down. I, I just, I like how the, the bait falls on eight pound. And like, like Garrett said, your, your rods doing all the work. You got a soft rod. Like I want the fish to eat the bait. And I feel like if you had a heavier line, you know, it, it might help a little bit. It might not, but I'm not worried about breaking them off. I mean, they're, you're usually fishing around nothing once you get them off the bottom. So I still fish with that, you know, eight, eight pound sunline sniper. That's pretty much gets the job done. <laughs> yeah. I'm the exact same eight pound all, all day long. Um, I think, you know, your chances of going to six, probably for everybody you get, you're probably going to lose two of them. So I think yep. eight pounds, your highest percentage. There's times where I might go to 10 when it's really thick cover, but 99% of the time it's eight pound. Eight, yeah. Eight pound test. I may, I might have to adjust my 20 pound test. <laughs> <laughs> Riz, we got, we got some questions from the IM board on bash. You guys were, uh, got, if we use your question on the air, we're going to be hooking you up with some cool, Bass University swag from us and some of our sponsors. So what do you got next in the queue, Riz? I got a question coming over from Facebook. Um, and I actually want I actually want Greg to lead off on this one. 